So I read through the Hollingberry's uh, specification, and I, there's a couple of uh, Haskell implementations I saw. Um, and I tried to think where I could fit some generic stuff into it. Uh, and I thought, well, this happens to be another library that I maintain, so I like uh, talking about it, I guess. But uh, I noticed there's a part where basically the specification calls for something like a printf. It says uh, you have a column with um, so many spaces for the price and the date and the description. And um, yeah, it, it's like suited specifically for printf. Printf is, has some well-known problems, and uh, I've written a library that has a solution to that. I'm not, I didn't come up with these ideas. I implemented some stuff that I've read, so this is not my uh, um, contribution to research, but my contribution to sort of, yeah, Haskell libraries. So this is what I thought I would uh, look at. So let's look at the, the problem. So you've, you're familiar with some variation of the printf function or the format function. It takes a string that's a format and then a variable number of arguments and uh, substitutes, prints out the string, substituting certain things with certain arguments. So this is an example. We have string with space with a w with a percent %d for an integer and uh, the rest of the string, rld, exclamation point slash n. Here I give it a string and a zero. And so it, it will print out hello w0 or old. Um, OK, fine. But if I happen to reverse those arguments for some strange reason, I wasn't paying attention that day. I had too much fear. Um, I get something really weird. I get a, it thinks the first thing is a null, an in, uh, yeah, empty string, I guess. And uh, this is what my Mac gives, so I don't know what your PC gives. Uh, and then some random thing. Um, and then, say, another time, I forget to include the second argument. Well, I get that weird thing again. Another thing that you may not really think this is a problem, but, well, maybe you want more. Maybe you want to define your own format descriptor. Well, you can't. Um, too bad. That's... Um, this actually just prints out Y on, on the Mac. Uh, yeah. But so suppose you, you, you would like to do this at times. Well, you might not be able to do it this way. So these are some problems uh, with printf. No type checking arguments. So I didn't realize that I reversed the types, that I put an integer where it's expecting a string, a string where it's expecting an integer. Yeah. No area checking. You didn't realize I dropped an argument. The variadic function printf, uh, it just went with whatever it could find in memory. The restricted set of format descriptors. So it didn't allow me to define my own. It's not extensible. I like things that are extensible. I like things that are generic. Uh, I couldn't do it. In Haskell, included in the, the standard, the base package, there's this function. This is in text.printf in base. So there's this abstract type class printf type. I don't know what it does. I could look in the source, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't tell me anything. Uh, and there's the string format descriptor, uh, just like in um, the example in C. And here, you guys see that? If I say, then I get that. And if I happen to reverse them, what does it do? Bad arguments. And if I happen to forget one, I think that's the next one, yep. And I get argument listed ended prematurely. Strange wording. Um, so this does not appear to be the solution to what to my problems that I presented. 
So, okay, maybe not the solution, but a solution uh, is this, uh, this function I have in my library, a library I call xformat. Um, so if you don't like the name, that's my fault, not the other people's. Um, this is, yeah, the module text.xformat.show. So what do we have? We have f as the format descriptor. So it's no longer a string here. We have some type families that I uh, talked about earlier, different kinds of different type families, a and f, appearing in weird places. And so this is a printf. <coughs> I should mention that this is the IO monad here with the uh, unit. So uh, it's kind of in a weird place here. Uh, we'll see that later. Here we have um, another variation, show f. So this is more like the show that we had. Uh, with a formatter, and this has a string. So the IO is now is a string in this one. Uh, yeah, IO or string. So it's the result type. Although it's kind of, like I said, it's in a strange position, but there's a reason for that. So here I want to do the same thing. Throwing up some weird things here. Mm -hmm. And then now though, zero. So this is what it looks like when I use it. Um, oh, I didn't define that one. Let's do this. So, yeah, sorry to change a bit. So this is what it looks like when I do it. This is my format descriptor. As I said, it's not a string now. It's actually, in this case, it's a uh, quadruple with some constant thing that's a string. Since it's capitalized, we can, well, we know it's a constructor at least. We have a string. We have another uh, data constructor that's called an int. So these are not actually the types. These are just constructors with the same names as the types. And another string. And we can take some arguments here. Hello and zero. OK? So good so far. Now, doing the other example here, if I reverse the argument, what do I get? Well, something ugly. A, uh, a type error. This is not an exception. Right? This is a runtime exception. This is a type error. OK, so Haskell type errors could use some TLC, but it's still a type error. Um, couldn't match type int with char. So this is the same as string. This is a list of characters. And that's telling me that somewhere it's expecting an int, but it got a character or, or a list of strings, or vice versa. It's expecting a, a string, and it got a, a, an int. Um, and then it gives a bunch of other stuff, which we won't worry about. OK, but at least it gave a type error. And the other example is Removing this. So let's clear the screen. And now we get some other strange error, which if you program with Haskell, you, you, re you soon recognize these, uh, uh, this pattern. Uh, no instance for show of this function. So what that means is that in GHCI, it's trying to take the result of this function and show it. That's how GHCI you know, as a REPL, that's how it works. It tries to show the result. Well, the result here happens to be a function. And it doesn't know how to print functions. I don't know how to print functions. I know how to read the code for a function, but if you gave me a function from, well, int to IO, I wouldn't know how to print that. You know, it's, you, so there's a problem here. It's expecting something else. And this is, again, a type error, uh, not a uh, runtime exception. So this, allowing for the, uh, the, 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 the bad type errors, um, or the maybe cryptic type errors, uh, this is a solution. This allows us, this prevents these problems that I strongly for. Um, I won't show, well, also you can know that I can, I can uh, extend it. I can add my new functors, or new uh, functors, new format descriptors. It's not a string, so I can create new ones. Um, so looking at this from the Holland Berries again, to continue with this example, this is what 
I might do for the, uh, I believe it's the output of that uh, application. You have a column and you have your um, price there, here, and then the year, the month, day with uh, slashes, and then uh, I left chop line, line my description stream and um, cut it off after 31 characters. And I also cut this one off after eight. And I give this a precision of two. So that is only prints the following the, the first two decimal places. So this is what it would look like with text.printf. Now, the text.exclement.show. First, I can actually, I'm actually going to break this down into smaller sort of consumable chunks. So this is what a format descriptor for the price would look like. So this is taking just this part here. And what I've said here is I've got a pair with a string and this uh, thing that does exactly that. Um, the naming, I don't know, you can give advice to me on that later. So this says, fill left um, eight characters of what's ever in here. So it fills up to the left uh, spaces, just like this guy. And this thing here says, this is a number with a precision of two. So print uh, at most the, or exactly the uh, two decimal places to the right of the period. Uh, more on that in a second. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Where does it, uh, where's the spaces in that, uh, how does it know to fill the spaces as opposed to zeros? So that's in the definition of this function. Okay. So, the, so the fill L is actually defined to uh, print, yeah, from the right, all of the uh, characters of whatever is in here and then fill all the to the left spaces. Um, that's, that's, it's defined in the function. Uh, there's, in the next example, this may answer sort of the other part of your question. This is the format for date. Here, I have a function called zero, which um, this says it expects an int, and it gives me two characters, and if the uh, string of that int, so if it's a one, it will zero out to the left at most two characters. So here, this explicitly says it's zero. Now, there, there is some underlying functionality which you could fill in with other characters if you want, uh, but this is maybe you know, more closely uh, aligned with this example. So here, I'm using these percents to divide uh, the different sections. You can think of the percent as exactly the comma. It's, it's simply it's synonymous with, with putting them together. So in the first one, it's a pair. In this one, it's a, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, quintuple. Uh, with, and I could easily put commas in the parentheses here. Uh, but then that says, okay, one, two, three, four. So we got strings, and then we got three holes that are all integer with slashes in them. And then the last one for the description, this is another variant on fill, but it fills to the right. So it prints as much as it can in the beginning. So this was left of the line, this is also left of the line. And then it fills uh, spaces out to the right. And the uh, tag or the, um, yeah, Quotation, uh, the quotes in quote says, or the prime, I should say, the prime says chop it off at 31. So it give me exactly 31. Don't go over. Uh, fill L allows it to flow over. Uh, and since the specification said there will never be any uh, prices greater than, what is it, 99,999? Yeah, then I, that's an error for somebody else to handle. Um, and the same thing for the, uh, for the uh, year. If we go over four digits in the year, well, time to get a new software. No, I just wanted to do that for example. Can I ask another question? Yeah. About, um, uh, the, the, the description, 
um, if if your description happens to be shorter than three modern characters, yeah. will both fill it up to spaces that the top print if and the lower one, or will the top will one chop it off and the other one fill it with spaces? It will fill. They will both fill. One chops and one doesn't. And it's just uh, given a description shorter of thirty one characters, the bottom one will chops. The bottom one chops. Yeah, bottom one says no more than thirty one. The top one says it may be more than eight, but I will only feel up to eight. So it's it's exactly um, having the uh, yeah. Is there an uh, analogous one here? The thirty one is. About that. Yeah. So I may have been a bit lax in my translation, uh, but uh, this one. Well, this one. I guess both. All of these chop off at the number designated, right? No, uh, they'll just fill. Huh? So they're, they're not going to chop off. They're just going to fill. I think. Well, fill, I mean, up to... And yeah, yeah. And but if you give a lo uh, string longer than 32 characters, or 31 characters, it's going to overflow. Both of them. Mm, no, I don't think so. Well, I think it chops. It chops? Yeah. Okay. No, I, I also think, given a string longer than 31, it, it, they both will do the same thing. I'm just wondering... Yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, okay. Given I think a string you're... shorter than 31, and say, a string of 5. Yeah, then it fills up to 31. It fills up to 31 yes. spaces in yes. both cases. Uh, you mean in this case and in this case? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Thanks. Now I understand your question. Yes. Um, could probably write a, I could write a different format that didn't fill up, for example, but this is, uh, they both fill. Okay, so then we've broken this down, but then we can combine it back together with um, this. Uh, tuple with the different format descriptors and a string for the new line. And here we actually, so we pass this to printf, and then printf knows exactly what arguments that he expects. And if you don't give it those, it will give you an error. Of course, if you get the year, month, day mixed up, it won't be able to check that. But Maybe a better thing would be to create a data type for year, month, day, and then you could you could handle that. Okay, so this is uh, this is the application part. Uh, next part is the understanding part. Did you implement that using the generics? So it's not the same generics that I described earlier. Yeah. That was one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it. Okay, so it's a different kind of generics, but you use, you implemented it is, using it, it generics. Uses uh, the structure of data types, but not the, like the sum of products view. And you can't do this with the uh, deriving part. Oh, okay. No. More questions about this? Okay. Let's see how I can do. Um, so, the obvious advantages are it's type safe. Uh, well, we've seen that. I'll show some more later. Maybe. Uh, it's computable, actually. So. We don't have to deal with strings. Well, that can be good and bad, right? So, but at least we don't have to. If you want, to, if you say you have to produce um, a format, you might need to change the width of that thing depending on some other inputs. Here, you're just computing a number, not a string. So, uh, modular composable. You saw that. That can break down the formats um, and combine them together. Of course, it is more verbose, um, natural disadvantage. I could create, I could make the uh, function names shorter, but then you know that might not be as uh, beneficial. Um, so there are, there are naturally trade-offs. There's a non-obvious advantage that using that the example, that, that this example has, but that doesn't appear, is that, for example, this prec format uh, descriptor for precedence, I mean, um, precision. It is actually more um, general than the one in the printf uh, from text.printf. In that, in that example, I specified it had to be uh, an f, a float. Uh, so a, 
um, I couldn't put an integer in there, even though I might have an integer for a, uh, a price. So prec is, uses this type class real, which has at least the instances for int, float, or double. So I can throw in these different types if I want to, and it will still give me the right output. So how does it work? Well, the first thing is polyvariate functions, um, variable under arguments, OK? And there are sort of three different uh, variations of this. Um, one is it requires an argument. You have a string as a format descriptor. Then the argument is going to be uh, a string. You can have a, so this is a constructor. If you have a, a string constant, then it doesn't take any arguments. This is part of the format itself. And if you have a composition, a triple in this case, you can have a, a string argument of constant, a string argument, and then two strings there. And um, in the end, what we get is a function given some composition of format descriptors. This is a, a vague composition uh, operator that I will describe more later. And let me see if I have. Yeah, I'll show the examples later. Okay. So what we're doing is we're tracking the argument and result types for each of these uh, uh, format descriptors. So uh, int says we're going to expect an int later. If there's a, the word string, expect a string later. If there's a uh, string constant, we don't expect anything later. Um, and we combine multiple descriptors using functor composition, which I will show. Um, so these, these format descriptors are functors. Uh, and a functor is another way of saying it's a, a type with a parameter. And we can uh, map over that parameter. So when you say you have this type class functor, um, you have fmap as its field, and fmap can sort of ch access that parameter. So we have three basic functors in this, um, this, this universe for this printf. The first one is we have an identity. An identity says there's no argument. It looks like this. It just takes its, the type parameter. The field is the type parameter. The same, the same type of that parameter. We'll see what that, how that's used later. An arrow. Arrow is sort of like a function. Uh, it has two type parameters. And its field is a function. So this is what you would put in your uh, in is an expression. And then the uh, type is going to be the arrow AB. Then composition is a way to combine different functors. So here we actually have functor types as arguments. And we do this uh, application here. So our last parameter in all of these is the parameter of the, the functor. And here we apply the first functor as a type, and then we apply the, or the second functor, and then the first functor around that. And we use this circle that's sort of usually used for composition. So these are the instances of a functor. I didn't think to show the type class functor, um, but maybe you can infer it from this. Um, Wherever you have, so you pattern match on the uh, constructor, and then you apply the f to the um, type that has the last type parameter. So if we go back, that's always a, the last one, a, b, and here it's a. So uh, in the arrow, this is actually composition, because the we're applying the fmap function to the result type of the function. And in the composition, it's a kind of, yeah, I don't know if that's brain frying or not, but we're f-mapping uh, our function 
as an argument to fmap, which we're applying to that. So it's two levels deep. Uh, that's where that's where the comes from. So those aren't that important. We want to dwell on those. But what this means is that these these ID arrow and composition give us some terms that we can build um, functor or format descriptors with. But you remember how I said earlier that we have this composition of functors, and then we want to get a type, a function type, out of this. And that's how we keep our, our that's how we get our uh, type safeness at the end. So we need a way to lift the functor so they get the actual composed function type. And what I mean by lift, this f is our functor. So we have this type class apply. It's uh, parameterized by f. F has to be a functor. We have some type family A. And this f is our functor. And this apply function lifts this functor to another level. It, it says, given this functor, we can create something of type A that's also parameterized by F and another A. So this is um, the type family works here the same as, as it did before. We, whenever we give an instance, we give the definition for apply and the synonymous type with A. A is going to represent our polyvariadic function. So it's the, the, the one that takes the arguments at the end, and uh, it will it will build this, and I'll show that shortly. So first, uh, the instances, and again, I don't want to dwell on these too much, um, but we'll just look at them. So the instances here. So apply gives us the type that's inside the identity uh, for the apply identity. Apply to the arrow or the function gives us the function and then the apply for the composition maps the apply over the so that's sort of taking the inner functor mapping apply over that and then mapping the result after that's been applied and this is where composition shows up uh, for this uh, type so this fmap apply is putting this inside this. And it might be, yeah, so here's the examples. Can you read the stuff on the left? Okay. No. If you can't, I'll be recapping it over here. Um, so what I put on the left here is um, an example of an apply with a particular functor. And what the type of that is on the right. And what I want to show you, I think the really interesting thing about this, I'm going to use uh, um, some functionality of GHC, is now T1 is just some random type. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, this. A is a, is a type family. It's a type. It's also a function, right? You take some some types as arguments, and then it gives you a type. What is that type? That's the question. And I use this uh, kind bang command, which is brand new for GHC seven point four. Not my contribution, but my uh, feature request actually. <laughs> um, and it will evaluate this type. You know, you have type synonyms and you have other things in the GHC. So not only do you evaluate the program, but the types also need to evaluate to figure out what the, the concrete types are. So let's figure out what this type function applied to its arguments maps to. So if I type that in, what it tells me is, OK, so kind is a way to type types, but that's not important. I want to look at what's actually equal to this type. And that type is equal to T1, a complicated way of saying uh, T1. But let's look at more interesting examples. Uh, 
this um, now says we have an A indexed on a arrow functor, and the first parameter to that arrow functor is C1, and then the second parameter, excuse me, of A is C2. So what does that type map to? A function from T1 to T2. Okay? Why does it do that? Because of this instance right here. So here you plug in T1 for A and T2 for B. Okay, so these and the rest, the left side, I won't worry about, but this is just to show you how this is, how I get this type. Now, um, if I go T2, T3, now, now I've added composition to the uh, mix. So this little circle is the same as this little dot. And I want to know, what is this A indexed by the composition of two R's? Uh, and the final argument T3 give me? Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. T1, arrow T2, arrow T3. So this composition really just put in uh, another arrow in there. So the first one maps the first one, the second one maps that one, and then we get the uh, composition. Um, do you know you know about currying and uncurring? So you have functions that take uh, a tuple of arguments, and you have uh, uh, functions that build up f arguments as functions, and you can transition between these two. So you can think of it like this. You can think of this being uh, an uncurried version. T1 plus T2 gives me a T3. And here, this is the curry version. It kind of works that way. So let's look at the next example. OK, I've got two examples here. Um, here, I'm throwing in an identity and a composed with a arrow and a T2. Any guesses? T1 to T2? Or T1 to T1 to T2. Um. T1 to T2. Oh. <laughs> any, any more guesses? T1 to T2 again. Or. Or. T1 to T2. So you see the pattern. So anything I throw in here, now you could probably figure out what's going to happen. Basically, the identity gets dropped, and the arrow adds a new argument to this function. So now, this is the kind of this is a different kind of generics than I've talked about before. This is it's it's there's structural in there, but it's a quite different structure. The structure I'm building is this thing, uh, but what did I get in the end is some function. And um, maybe you can start to see how printf then can get to be uh, the way it is. But in the meantime, we'll look. So complicated function doesn't really matter. The important thing is the type. Um, take two functor, functors that have strings and give me the composition of those two functors with string as the argument. Now, with that, we can start building up uh, something like a format descriptor, except that I call it format functors. Not right there. Now, again, it's actually more interesting to look at the type here. We have arrow string ID, arrow A, where A has a show constraint on it, 
ID. One, two, three, four. So this is back to the, uh, the sort of the, the pairs we saw earlier, or the, the tuples, I should say. Then we have this composition of uh, functors. So this is the composition at the type level. This is the composition at the term level. You map these this way. And here, uh, you can, you, you have to, you think, okay, arrow, that takes a function. The argument was a function. And the first type is going to be the argument type of that function. And our result type is a string. So actually, the type of this is going to be string to string. And the same here. We have uh, the show function, which we saw earlier. It's going to be from A to string, where A has a show constraint. So we have A with a show constraint to string. And these are the two going to be the arguments after we apply it. And then the identities get dropped. And the identities are exactly the string constants. Now if we have that and we apply it, we get our function. The function type we want. Because we want something that takes a string and something that takes an A with a show constraint and gives us the string. So that's where the apply comes in. Then we can, we get almost our printf. So this is the format descriptor, this is the lifting, and this is the printf. Mind blown? Mm. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Lefty. <laughs> Not quite good enough. Okay. We can go a step further because we don't want you to write ID, R, and com. We want to write um, what I wrote, string, int. We want to write these things. So we actually extend it further. We had this apply class, and the apply class was a superclass was a functor. Now we have a format class whose superclass is, a, a, is an apply with yet another uh, associated type synonym or type family. And then we have this show f prime. Prime is just in the sense that this is not what you use normally. Um, that returns this crazy ff string. And just to confuse you more, the f, this f you can think of as the format descriptor, and this f you could think of as the functor. And then I didn't want to add another f for function, but it gets confusing. So this would be what you would normally use, except you know, it could also be printf. Uh, and we're applying the f, f, getting this a, and then we, the argument would be the format descriptor. So okay, what does this look like? Well, this isn't actually quite, this isn't too much more blind one. Really, it's quite simple. If you have an instance of a format uh, that's a string, and these are string constants, these are the things that we don't want as arguments, that these are, you know, these are the constants in the format, then what do we use? We use ID. And here, we just pass the string, wrap it in an ID, and we're done. Now, if we want something that will produce an argument later, like the int, I use. Um, what we need to do is we need to create a new data type specifically for this particular format script. And in this case, this data type is quite simple. It just has one constructor. And this constructor is what you use when you write the printf. You use that in the format. This type is what gives you the instance. So this is why you have to create this, this data type because you need a unique instance uh, for the format class. So since we know that we want uh, this type to be an argument at the end, we use an, uh, this R with the type that we want as the argument, and we wrap the function that's going to uh, translate this type to a string. In that case, it's show, or show int as we had before. Um, so this is what you do for every type that you want, int, double, 
float, string, everything you want as an argument. You can even extend this with your own data type. You know you could create, you create date, and you create a for, an instance for format for date, so you don't have to worry about the uh, month, date, year order. And um, yeah, this is, a, a, it's, it's, it's really just this simple. And then it gets a bit more complicated when you want to compose functions, function, uh, format descriptors. So here we have a pair. We used pair triples, quintuples before to compose stuff. So it actually is implemented with composition, both here and here. And uh, here we're recursively using the type of the uh, the, the type associated type synonym associated with this format class here. So we're constructing this type recursively, you know, polymorphically recursively. And the same thing here, we're, we're constructing this polymorphically recursively again. And there are more interesting instances that do things like precision and fill and stuff, which are more, yeah, technical and, and, and not the this kind of interesting. But uh, there's code, and I'm still working on this, the new version, which as I was developing this talk, I was working on the new version, so it worked out well. Um, OK, one last thing, almost done. Show f. So this is show f. I didn't really show you the actual printf. How do you define printf? So we can't just do add a putster or put string uh, with the show f. This is what happens. This is what the type looks like. So this is something you may not have seen before. This is a, a type equality. And this says that these two types must be synonymous. They must be equal. Mm -hmm. What does that say to you if these two types must be equal? You must make them the same type, so you have to curse the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if this type is equal, this is the type that gives us the, the function that we want. Mm -hmm. So this is the one I showed you with the examples that you give a different format descriptors. Uh, for here, and it would give you a different function. But if it has to be equal to a string, there's no function there. You lose all of that. So you can't you can't do this. Uh, okay. you, I mean, we do this, but you can't. It won't be useful. This is this is a, not a useful uh, a definition to have. So we can't simply say put string compose string. And that's why you know when I was describing this earlier, I said this is in a weird position because this is not actually. The result type of this function, really, this thing gets filtered, you know, built up into some function here, and then the string shows up here. So if you say, so this will probably be a function, and if you say this function has to be a string, it can't be a function, so there goes your old fun games. But it's a functor. And this is what is great about Haskell, is that you can just throw in an F map and everything's solved. Um, Show f prime. Show f prime uh, returns a uh, this type, and we can so this is a functor with this last parameter here, and we can f map the putster so that this thing, which was a string in show f prime, is now an I O. So if you didn't know, putster is a string arrow I O unit. So that's where that comes from. Um, so now we can have our real printf just by first fmap putster and then apply. And that's why that the IO shows up in the weird position and the string shows up in the weird position. Okay. Um, so that's the idea of the, the, the this part of the library. There's a difference where the actual implementation uses a function on strings instead of a string. It's more efficient, but not that interesting. There's also a read equivalent, like scanf. Uh, that's the type. It's a different format class. And uh, it doesn't use functors. It's a bit simpler. Um, and the R determines the structure. So it could be a, a tuple of things that get read. Um, OK. 
And then there are a bunch of references for later perusal. Um, these slides, as soon as I get a chance, uh, and after I fix some typos, um, will be on GitHub, and I will send out the link so that, along with the code there so you can actually play with it. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Are there any uh, questions or anything? <laughs> I know it's late, and <laughs> yeah, it's your mind's blown. Yeah. Right. Who was the first person to do that uh, typed printer, that uh, statically typed? First person was probably Olivier Danvi. Uh, I think he, as far as I know, he came up with the problem. He called it functional unparsing. Um, yeah, back in '98, and that was sort of a ML kind of thing. Ralph Enza did it more in the style that I'm producing, uh, I'm describing. And none of these have made it into the standard so the Haskell libraries or no modules. No. Well, before I did X format. There was no like uh, real library release. There's code floating around. Um, if you ever have heard of Oleg Kisilov, uh, he's uh, he's had his website. He puts up stuff all the time, and he's a genius and can explain any complicated thing to you. Not necessarily in simple words, but um, <laughs> he he comes up with all kinds of stuff. So he's got all this stuff on his website, um, but he doesn't really uh, develop libraries and release them. Sure. Um, he develops ideas. He does. He does develop ideas. Lots of ideas. Um, this last one is my is a link for my references. So if you want more references on this type of stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I read this stuff and I realized there wasn't anything available and uh, I liked the idea and I thought I would explore it. So I, I wrote wrote up this library in two thousand nine. And I did a talk on it at the end of the Dutch Hub. And then, um, yeah, when I was looking at the uh, Pauling Berries, it looked like it was appropriate. And it also gave me a chance to update it. So when I first did it, it used a function of dependencies. And uh, Thai families were not as mature as they are now. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to put something out there and uh, see if people use it. I don't know if anybody used it, but I'm happy that, I, that I've now have updated and I've, I think it's improved a lot, actually, uh, since I did last then. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry to uh, taking so long. No, no, it was uh, very interesting. Time out of your drinking. No, no, no. <laughs> it's uh, much better. Yeah. <laughs> to, uh, yeah. But yeah, we'll have to, I'll have to look at those slides a little bit. And <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, I'll look over them a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been nice to actually have had them while we were, sure. so that I could go back and refer, because yeah. it's sort of like you miss one step, but yeah, yeah. you go further yeah, on. Yeah, you have to go look at it again. <laughs> Well, I just finished them today, so it's been great. That's fine. Wrapped it up today. That's so bad. Earlier on, at the end of your first section, you were talking about um, you could use uh, generic functions to compare, to do equality comparison of data types. So, would that be suited to a kind of a structural comparison where you're just looking for the same, um, like, basic types in, in, in somebody's data type? You could basically compare the shape of the type to another type. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I don't think so. Yes. So is, is that something that is typically used? I mean, do you come across that, or can you think of a use case? Well, equality and, or, and comparison is, is very common. It's very, I mean, there are a lot of times where you, you want to find the equality of different, uh, different terms of the same data type. Um, there are some things where <coughs> you want to look, say you have two <coughs> functors, so they might have different parameter types, but the structure could be the same. Yeah. You can also look at it at, 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 at yeah. things like yeah. that, where you find the quality of structure and ignoring, you know, you have two lists, but you want to know they're the same length, for example. Right. That's, a, that's a, an instance of that kind of comparison. Okay. So you don't actually care what's in the parameter. Right. No. Okay. Yeah.
What, so what's the, uh, the plan now? Is it so late that it's time to go home? Or? No. Yeah, I think we have a few more beers, and those that want to go can go. That's what okay. Stay, can stay. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for taking time out of your, out of your schedule and coming visiting us. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. We've all learned a lot, I'm, I'm sure. Um, yeah, if I uh, somehow my, my brain has, <laughs> won't recover anytime soon. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was really, really good. Thanks. Thanks yeah. a lot. If yeah. I uh, yeah, come down here again, I get a chance. I'll, if you guys want, I can maybe give another talk on something else that's unrelated. Good. Well, yes, definitely. Yes. Uh, I don't. I, 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 I like doing it, and when I have time. Yeah, great. And we always on the lookout for new speakers. So if, if you hear, we do it once a month. Yeah. And um, yeah, if you hear any time, then. And, and, if, we'll and if you guys ever come to Holland, come to the Dad Chasco Users Group. We also meet once a month. Uh, we don't have talks every month. Sometimes we just meet for beer. Um, <laughs> but we're happy to, to receive you. Okay.